Okay. Let's give it a few seconds here. And uh, I guess it'll automatically go over to me since I'm talking, but it doesn't seem to be doing that. Uh, hmm. Oh, you mean as far as, I don't know if I had it on, um, on only the person speaking or if it's oh, okay. the whole thing. Wait, I can maybe find that. Check one, two, three, check one, two, three. No, it's still on you. So, uh, participants, let's see. Um, I don't know. Display participants' names. I don't know. We could just do it with all three, all of us, you know, because okay. by the time I find out where that is, Unless you can, unless you know where it is, Jerry. I don't. I'm like I'm looking as well. Quickly. Um, so up in the upper right corner of Zoom, there's a little button that says View. Oh, okay. Speaker and, should be on speaker, right? Yeah. If you click that J, it'll say Speaker or Gallery, and then if you do Speaker, it'll just keep track of who's talking, and the camera will go right. to that okay. person. Yeah. All right, well, let's test it and see if it goes to me because it's not going to me. Why is it not going to me? But see, that's you... that's only on the um, on the viewing, I think. I yeah. think there's something else for in the recording when you're actually recording. Yeah, the recording, it will, I think, default to, okay. to doing a speaker view. It should. Okay, all right. All right, you ready to do this? I'm good. If you guys are ready, let's go for it. All right. Hello, I'm Jerry Tashwa. I am the chairman of the pedagogy committee for the Vibraphone project. So what exactly is the Vibraphone project? Well, about a three years ago, I guess it's been, uh, an organization was formed to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the instrument that we love, the Vibraphone. We had a lot of plans on doing a lot of different things. We were going to do uh, a kind of a conference on vibraphone. We were going to do clinics and performances. And then COVID hit. Well, during COVID, obviously everything shut down. So we were uh, somewhat removed from the plans that we had in place. Uh, but the pedagogy committee, which again, I'm chairing at this point, uh, was capable of doing Every other month, we would do a virtual uh, clinic in which we would invite different people. I've done a few of them and a couple other people have done them. Uh, and today we have our special guest, Jay Hogard, who's a, a friend that I have known for quite a long time. We actually met, Jay, if I remember correctly, we were either at the North Sea Jazz Festival in Holland or the Montreux Festival in Switzerland. I was with my band and you were playing with a guitar player. I can't remember Kenny who it Burrell, was. With Kenny, Kenny Burrell. Kenny Burrell. Okay, there you go. Anyway, oh, we, fi we finally got the chance to meet and it was a pleasure and we we've been friends uh, ever since. Uh, we burnt 1987. Really? <laughs> okay. We had we had no gray hair then, <laughs> <laughs> and no gut. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, as of this year, both Jay and myself are both new grandfathers or new grandparents. Right? Is that your first? Yeah, my first. We we weren't. No, we were married. I I was married. I think we were both. Married in by 87. But, oh, yeah, I was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we are in 20, 2021. We became 20. granddaddies. Right. Well, I, I, mine was in uh, April of 2022. So, yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm running three months into it. But, oh, okay. but anyway, I would, I'd like to welcome on behalf of the Vibraphone Project, Mr. Jay Hogard, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about, I guess, his concepts and, and, what's going on with his world of the vibraphone and then uh, if anybody else joins us we are going to try to open it up for questions if not we'll just chat for a little bit at the end and see how it goes so if, if with no further ado let me present jay hogard thank you jay well thank you 
Jerry, and yeah, we were into our little spiel that would have been, we couldn't be quite entertaining as just telling granddaddy stories. I wanted to start with this. Um, I hope everyone can see this. Are you seeing, are you seeing the pointer also? Yes. Okay. So here is the vibraphone and here is the marimba. And this is the company that I still play. And Jerry doesn't play this company anymore. He plays Bergerot. I still play Musser. He used to play Musser. And there are other companies. And Lee Stevens company uh, is uh, that uh, is Malatech. And there are any number of other great companies, manufacturers of the vibraphone, of a modern vibraphone and modern marimba. And these instruments are the predecessors, they're modern versions of the predecessors of these instruments. They're also made of wood, as is the marimba, although the marimba can also be made of kalon or other synthetic substances. But um, this one is called the geel, a geel, and this is, one is called a ban, and this is, one is called a balafone. And these are three instruments from different parts of West Africa that were the prototypes that came not under the joy of voluntary immigration, but under the brutality of the forced labor slavery system. But one coincidental benefit, not benefit, but cultural phenomena was that uh, that some of the people who were uh, kidnapped in the in this brutal brutal system of atrocities remembered the the instruments that were from their childhood or from their original culture, and they tried to uh, merge them in the context of the Caribbean and Central and South America, and they created instruments that had different names originally, but then were all called the marimba. And, and they were originally pentatonic, five-tone, hexatonic, six-tone, sometimes three-tone instruments uh, within a scale. But later, it, it, uh, it became adapted into the, the diatonic chromatic system and became uh, uh, seven no eight notes to an octave and uh, 12 notes in the subdivisions which was the model that is uh, what we call a marimba now the manufactured marimba in uh, america and around the world and again made of wood and then the the idea of using aluminum bars and uh, materials was in the early 20th century the late uh, the late 19-teens and in 1924, I think, the, or somewhere around there, the first version of a aluminum bar. First, actually, they were steel, but then aluminum bar, 12-tone, model, modeled after the marimba and was called the vibraphone. And the other thing, here we have these things that we all know are the resonators, and they also aluminum alloy. The original resonators of the original African instruments were made of gourds. And a, a gourd is like a pumpkin uh, type. It's in the pumpkin family. And there's a very complex uh, a process of, of acquiring and drying and clearing out the gourds as well as the uh, cutting down and of the trees and or the using fallen trees of a s very specific type and and a very complex process of drying the wood and then tuning the bars and tuning the bars in relationship to the gourds and these the these are this this instrument here the balafone is a uh, six note hexatonic. Uh, octave within an octave here is a five note the geo from northwest ghana this is from mali 
and Guinea and Gambia and, uh, and parts of Senegal. And this is from Burkina Faso and Northwest Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. And there are, are other instruments like these in other places around the continent of Africa with variations of the construction and the tuning. And each of the tunings correspond to tunings within the indigenous languages of the, the makers and the practitioners. So there's a direct relationship between the vocalization and the key tones in the uh, vocalization and the, um, and the tuning of the instruments, as is this relationship to what we think of as this universal uh, diatonic chromatic tuning, but actually that uh, only that's only about 500 years old where it's been standardized, and that basically was uh, uh, central Central Western Europe or particularly Germany, and it ties to the original uh, vocal uh, styles of of that language, and then became a widely a accepted across Europe and standardized. And so that's how we end up now with these 12 tones on this instrument and understanding a sequence of two, 3,000, 4,000 years of human history where the mallet instruments, instruments that are played with a stick with some type of attachment which softens uh, the sound here and gives it a more full tone uh, this is where we we have developed the notion of uh, of uh, our modern sound on the vibraphone. So that's that's the uh, the the short, the tiny, tiny version of an ethnomusicological perspective on the instrument that we know and love. If, if I may interrupt you for one second, and sure. I, I, on on the Jill, there, there's a fellow that I met. I can't remember his name. He died a few years ago. He was like the master of it. But when I first heard a Jill, it had this buzzing sound. And I thought the bar was broken because it had a fuzzy sound to it. And I remember asking him, do, do you need to get that bar replaced? He said, no, there's actually historically a spider web that is in the gourd that vibrates, that produces that buzzy sound that you get. And he said, it's hard to get spider webs nowadays. So he was able to come up with some kind of a, a synthetic uh, a wool kind of thing or something that he would put in the gourd to simulate that buzzing. But I, but I had to in inject that. Bernard Woma probably is. There it is, Bernard. He, Bernard that's, I, and one, Bernard's best story about that is he had a, he was called to do a symphony gig and, um, and he showed up with his instrument and started playing and the buzz and the tuning. And the conductor said, well, excuse me, sir, but the, um, uh, that buzz is a problem. Can you get rid of it? And, and the point was, and while he was telling this, I said, well, Bernard, it was a good thing I wasn't there because I would have said, no, you idiot. The buzz is the core of the sound because the buzz is the spirits. The buzz is the spirits of the ancestors living and speaking through the instrument. So the, the uh, um, spider web or uh, 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 a attachment that went into the gourd was, uh, as you say, it's, it's much more difficult to get that. So they use cigarette paper, they've used other materials to try to emulate that buzz because the buzz is is the spirit speaking through it. And then on the issue of the tuning, the the conductor said, "Well, can you change the tuning a little bit so you can uh, so you can tune with the orchestra?" And I would have said, "No, you tell the orchestra to tune to the geo because the orchestra is out of tune. Because in terms of historic." What I just explained about the uh, the nature of the tuning, the diatonic system came over a thousand, maybe two thousand years after that five tone uh, 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 tuning that that uh, uh, Bernard Woma was a uh, member of the Dagare 
uh, ethnic group and the Dagare uh, people, that tradition, the, the tuning of the instrument, as I said, is directly connected to the, the musical, key musical tones within the, within the language. So, and the point was, well, if you wanted him, why did you call him? Because if you wanted the marimba, they are, that already exists. Go get a marimba, buddy, you know? <laughs> but the idea of, of, of uh, being inclusive without being genuinely uh, aware of the complexities that, that things don't cross exactly uh, from one tradition to another and things have a historic sequence. And that's right. my point, Jerry, that I thank you for bringing that up, that we as the mallet players are at really at the cutting edge in terms of an instrument that represents all of um, the pathology and the transcendence of, of the modern world in, in the sound of our instruments, in both the, the metal sound of the vibraphone and the wood sound of the marimba and its, and its uh, 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 parallel instruments from which it came. So, yes, and uh, I have an instrument that I wasn't able to bring down to my studio today uh, that was made by another uh, master who toured quite a bit, I, so I could demonstrate that buzz, by Kaklaba, Kaklaba, K-A-K-R-A-B-A, Lobi, L-O-B-I. So if the listeners check on YouTube, just uh, put in the, the name Kaklaba Lobi or Bernard Woma or Gil, G-Y-I-L, and you can find many examples of those instruments and uh, very good recordings and other recordings uh, that, rep that show the buzz and show the tuning and, and demonstrate uh, all the, the, um, the fantastic techniques that are, um, that go along with performing on those instruments. So that was, the ethno I wanted to kind of touch on three parts today. I wanted to do the kind of ethnomusicology of the, uh, uh, of the instrument. And I wanted to, uh, I guess I'll play now. I wanted to talk though for a second about in terms of technique, because we're already 17 minutes in, uh, that, uh, the whole idea of playing two mallets and playing four mallets. Now, I'm someone who strongly believes that a mallet player and practitioner should study and practice both techniques because they both bring uh, uh, a very different yet overlapping sensibility and approach uh, to how to uh, execute, particularly in the music called jazz. For certain uh, uh, kinds of orchestral situations, but uh, the, the, even with that, that that both a two mallet approach, which is a kind of more connected to a, a drum, uh, drum and timpani model, is at sometimes really important and uh, very helpful in executing uh, 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 passages and executing the. Uh, uh, vocabulary and certainly with jazz, uh, we're constantly combining both harmonic and melodic vocabulary. Uh, so th both the four mallet tradition and the two mallet traditions can be merged uh, in terms of understanding how to uh, perform on the instrument. So I wanted to play a uh, a song, one of my compositions, it's kind of built like a standard, uh, uh, you're in my heart all the time. And I wanted to show how I try to combine the approach. The, my, my lineage is uh, from Milt Jackson, Lionel Hampton, Milt Jackson, Bobby Hutchison, Cal Jader, and many others, uh, Terry Gibbs and Lem Winchester and a whole lot of other people. Uh, who are all two mallet players, but I'm also, I studied with uh, Dave Friedman, my friend Dave Friedman and uh, Gary Burton. Uh, I, well, it was more informal with Gary, but so I have, uh, as well as another uh, friend who was a drummer, Bob Gatson, who studied with Gary. And so I've always tried to combine 
the two and the four mallet construction of melody. So if it's, okay, I have to cut it short because we don't have a lot of time. No, you don't, you don't need to worry about time, Jay, where, you know, we take as long as we need, so. Okay, so this is a ballad I wrote for my wife, You're In My Heart All The Time.
There you go. There you go. But hey, I've got to ask, since you wrote that for your wife, did it get you out of doing some chores? <laughs> I I had to tell her today that I was practicing her tune, so I wasn't going to do the dishes, you know? So <laughs> There you go. Good deal. No, that was nice, man. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. So, yeah, and the idea being that, that the way to, I mean, I, 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 I usually play that um, with the band, and I play it with two mallets. I usually play more like the Milt, out of the Milt line. You know, no one plays ballads like Milt Jackson. Milt Jackson defines how to play a ballad, not just for the vibraphone, but for every instrument. But, um, yeah, I said, I want to try to do something different. And the point is that the way that, uh, um, that I approach uh, four mallets is because the ways that I have studied and, and, and practiced playing two mallets. And there's a certain kind of angling in your lines that comes from, from both. And you could probably go to how to play two mallets uh, informed by a four mallet kind of approach. So uh, they all intersect. And, and the point is that someone, there was a time period when we were uh, uh, first starting that people were, well, I mean, if you don't play four mallets or you don't play two mallets, blah, 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 blah. No, it's, it's all about using all of the available tools and techniques in order to get uh, the point across. Now, the other thing that I wanted to do uh, is mention that I have this uh, new record coming uh, in September, and here it is. Can you see it? I hope you can see it. Yeah, we can see Raise it. Raise your spirit consciousness. And here I'm playing four mallets and standing out in front of the beach. Uh, and the idea, though, is uh, that uh i i do a lot i don't have any solo pieces on this record i have other records if people are interested you can go to my website which is jhogard.com j that's how you spell it j a y h o g g a r d.com and uh, you know the a bunch of my records are listed there and you can get them however you get recordings these days and i've i've done many solo things and have several solo records out but on this record, I'm uh, with uh, a quintet with uh, Dwight Andrews on soprano sax and bass clarinet, and actually it's sextet, Nat Adderley Jr. on piano, James Weidman on organ and piano, uh, uh, Faron Akhlaf on the drums, and Kenny Davis on uh, bass. And so when you're playing with an ensemble, that's one set of things and the way that you fill up the space. And it's different than when you play solo, which you fill up the space in a totally different way. So you have to think in terms of harmonically and melodically, and then how melodically is what most people understand, the average listener understands more than the harmonic in the sense that, that people who are not as, as sophisticated in their understanding of music you know, go to vocal melodies first. So when you make the vibraphone sing, and that, in fact, the word um, uh, bala, uh, which of balaphone and geo both reference singing wood, and the, and the word marimba. Is, uh, marimba is a key Swahili word, the Swahili language of uh, East and Central Africa, East, Central, and Southern Africa. So it's, a West, it's an African word and they all reference the wood singing. So you have to make the vibraphone sing as well as make it have vertical structures, make it the, the melodic structures have harmonic accompaniment that is interesting, you know, and then we could talk about voicings and you talk about where you, how you use uh, uh, support within a, um, within a melodic structure, or if it's primarily a harmonic structure, how to execute that, and then how to execute it in the context of a, um, uh, of a ensemble and in a solo setting. 
So those are the three main things I wanted to talk about. And I see we're at 829. So we're, even though we're being flexible with the time, we wanted to stay within a half hour. Those right. were the three areas I wanted to touch on. And I guess right now we won't have any questions, but if you want to ask me anything, or if Joyce, if, or if you want to, I mean, Boyce, I'm sorry, Boyce Jeffries, if you want to comment, or uh, Jerry, if you have any thoughts or whatever. I'd... Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you actually sound like like my wife a little bit. My, my wife is Marlene. She's predominantly the composer in my band. She writes all of our music. And I'm, I'm a frustrated composer. I have a hard time. I'm real good at the first bar. That second bar, it's like option anxiety. It can go a million different ways. But her key thing is melody, melody, melody. I mean, she wants to hear a development of a melodic line. The harmony then is something that you support it with. The rhythm is something you support it with. But, but the melody is the key. I mean, that's, that's what you want to try to bring out. And, and I find that to be true, not only in compositions, but in improvisation. As you're playing, you're trying to spontaneously develop a melody and, and it's a conversation and you're filling it out. You're coming to a climactic moment and developing an idea and then you're pulling out and then the next solo. So, I mean, do you agree with what I just said? Is that that's sound like what you were pretty much hinting at as well? Yeah, I mean, the thing about the vibraphone that is, see certain instruments, single line instruments, that isn't, and it is, isn't an option to also play a vertical accompaniment, right? So, and especially if one is improvising, but, you know, in a composition or in a, in a, in a song or in a composition, an extended composition, a conceptual work, whatever, uh, it's not that everything has to be a pop tune, but me right. melodic means that it has a character which, which the brain can interpret as some, some, something to hold on to, some sequence of intervals that, that is something to hold on to. Although one can be in composition and be completely harmonic or rhythmic, you know, I mean, it's not limited to one or the other, but, but, uh, you know, oftentimes we get really caught up in, in harmonic structures because harmonic structures are so mathematically advanced, you know, in certain ways when you have chords that when you go out of the four note chords into, you know, six note, seven note, eight note, nine note, and what their relationships are, that can be intriguing. And as a composer, and then of course, uh, people can, can, can uh, composers can draw material not thinking in terms of vertical structures at all. For me, I like thinking in terms of rhythm, melody, and harmony all the time. There are other components, but those are the three that in elementary school, in music class, back when we were in elementary school, these days, a lot of schools don't even have music programs, but when you are fortunate, usually they say, what are the three components of music? Well, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And not necessarily in that order. The point is all those orders overlap. But what I wanted to say is because the vibraphone is, uh, you know, when you play with two mallets, you don't necessarily think uh, as harmonically in terms of stating the harmonic material the way you do with four mallets because, because you can execute the melody with two of the mallets and then you have two more to do something with it. And the question becomes, do you use one and two in the left hand, do you use one, two, three, four, do you use three and four, do you use one and four, and you know, where do you assign the melody and where do you assign the accompaniment in any particular structure, whether it's for one beat, whether it's for a part of a beat, whether it's for a whole measure. So these are the things that when we as, as uh, involved in, in, in both pre-composed and spontaneously composed musics, uh, we're thinking about these different layers, particularly on this instrument. Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about the instrument per se. As you know, and I'm sure most of your, our listeners know that I was also a Musser artist for just a couple months shy of 50 years. I was signed by Mr. Ludwig when I was a junior in high school. So I've, I've been with him for a long time. And the reason I, I'm not with them now is primarily because 
I found I was stifled in the world of F, from F to F, three octaves, and I wanted down to C. I wanted down to C so bad all of my life. I said, why don't we finish the answer? Why are we stuck in this goofy world of F? And uh, I heard a lot of other instruments that had those extra three notes, and they just didn't sound great. There was, there was a harmonic thing that you, you didn't hear the fundamental, especially on the Yamaha instruments. And um, anyway, so when I, when I was in Europe a couple of years ago, I played a, the Bergerol. And boom, it's like, wow, finally, the instrument is finished. And I heard a fundamental in those notes. And so they sent me one. And when I got one of their instruments in house, I was like, I couldn't believe it. Finally, I'm home. You know, finally, I'm out of that world of F. And I had a conversation one time with Mike Maneri, and he was the same way. He goes, man, whoever thought F would be like where we need to be? I mean, this is like, you know, even an E, just an E gives us like we could play guitar literature and fit in with guitar. But that world of F is so confined and you're playing a great line and then you get to the bottom and you have to almost imagine transposing to somewhere else because you just run out of notes. But what I'm finding with the, the extra extended range of this Bergeron instrument, it's like all of a sudden I don't have to like overthink it anymore. It's so natural. Uh, yeah, it's a bigger instrument. Yeah, it's heavier. But man, it has opened it up musically for me like I, I have only imagined and I'm so happy to have it. What, what's your thinking on, on the world of F? Well, I, I mean, I agree completely. That's why I love playing the marimba uh, because, you know, the marimba can go down to, to the C. Five octaves, uh, yeah. Uh, all the way down and it can go up too, depending on which one it is. But um, play, carrying the marimba on a gig is <laughs> <laughs> on a practical level. And this is the other thing I wanted to say to, to young musicians that, that uh, you have to do this because you love it, because it, just getting from one event to another, carrying the instrument is, is a challenge. And as Jerry said, the more, uh, the wider the, the frequency spectrum of the instrument, the tonal spectrum, the, uh, the more stuff you gotta carry. And so I love, I've always loved the, you know, the possibility of going down and up on the marimba. And like you, I always enjoyed uh, the attempts of the various companies to 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 go down to that C, this the the it would be uh, C three I guess uh, down to C three, correct F three, uh, yeah down to C three. You can go there's a marimba can go down to C two, um, yeah. So I I mean I agree it has tremendous but but the, the physics of it were complicated in terms of coordinating the, 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 the kind of alloy to make the bar ring correctly, and then to have the, uh, the damper, you know, when you had such a wide damper uh, to make it uh, consistent throughout. So uh, I've, I've played the, the older version of the Bergerot four octave, uh, three and a half octave, and I haven't played the one that you're playing yet, and I can't wait to to get down to that C. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing instrument. Um, speaking of when we talked earlier about Milt Jackson, so I've, I've seen Milt a number of times when I was a student at Berkeley. He used to come to the jazz workshop and play. I saw him with his band. I saw him with Modern Jazz Quartet, and I was always mesmerized by the fact that he was so calm when he played it's almost like like he just didn't care he was just like almost like sleepy and just beautiful melodies and just with like no energy exerted i mean he was just a calmness about his play i mean he would burn sometimes i mean he'd get real kicking but most of the time he would just like sweet and he'd find i call them watermelons he would hit that one note that's like wow <laughs> i mean that note doesn't exist anywhere else but well, that was milk. his tone. Yeah, yeah, that was his tone. And well, I would say uh, the smoothness is what made it appear to be effortless. It was, it was, it was a smoothness and a consistency 
across the range. Part of it is because he was left-handed. See, as a left-handed player, um, you have kind of an advantage going. Anyway, the mechanics, the physical mechanics of how you go from one end to the other, whether it's F3 to F6 or C3 to, to I guess, C6, although I don't know if there's a, marim, a vibraphone that goes to C6 yet, but there... But there's a that you can do that on marimba and and xylophone so the 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 physics are going da, 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 da. so because milt was left-handed i always said that that he had and not every left-handed person has that but because of the physics of going left to right and then of course descending is right to left uh it it it, it contributed to the appearance of effortlessness effortlessness but he was very impassioned and uh, uh, energe energetic in terms of you know uh, his linear construction and depending on the MJQ that was part of their uh, uh, image was you know blues on like Bach it. and you know that they were these guys in tuxedos and you know they were uh, as yeah. as smooth as smoother than silk i mean yeah, that was well, the whole true. image but then and also you know it had something to do with the way connie k played as the drummer versus say the records that milt made with philly jo philly joe jones or Art blakey or, or other drummers who played in a more aggressive style but milt's milt's style was essentially um had had a feeling of effortless effortlessness yet completely in the context of the vocabulary of charlie parker and dizzy gillespie the yeah. the music called identified as bebop and and john coltrane you listen on on uh bags and train that fellow back there and and uh uh milt was bashing right with train in in you know 1959 the way that a train was hitting hard in 1959. So yeah. Milt could hit hard. Yeah. Uh, speaking of hitting hard, so let's talk about technique a little bit. When, when I was in college, I remember the vibraphone didn't have pickups available at that time. And I didn't have microphones. So I played hard. And I remember constantly just wearing it out and sweating and hitting it. And my hands would hurt, breaking mallets. and. And, and then later on in life, as I, as I got older and microphones got better and things like that, I realized by playing hard, I lost technique. I lost the ability to be sensitive. My dynamic range didn't exist. Everything was mezzo forte or forte, you know, just well and all the time. And I started doing yoga. And this is weird because in the yoga teacher, he would talk about the breath. He would talk about take a deep breath, hold this pose, and then exhale. And I found out that as I was playing, when I would do aggressive fast lines, I would quit breathing. After I started taking yoga, I realized I got to breathe. I got to breathe through. And it changed my whole concept of playing and relaxation. And now I find that my, my technique is better. My, my dexterity is better. My ability to play comfortably is better. And, and it all has to do with confidence and relaxing at the instrument and not feeling like you have to, you know, hit it with your arms and force it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, total, totally agree. Um, I, you have a, a technique book out, don't you? I do, yes. Uh, I mean, a vibraphone book. I, I've been teaching college for 30 three years, but I focused on making records and composing as opposed to writing my technique book. But my book would be called uh, Yoga Qigong of, of Mallet Playing. So totally, totally agree with that. And, and the breath. So again, going back, Milt Jackson's tone, the, the beauty of that tone, that, like you said, the one hit that you that just resonates all through your body and consciousness is all that comes from developing the gentle touch the gentle touch the hard touch is useful at times 
you know, if you're playing with a real aggressive, uh, uh, high-powered drummer, it's a good thing to develop that too. But that's, like you say, you still have to breathe through it. You have to breathe through it constantly. That's the key is breathing through it. And yes, as you said back in the days without the um, sound reinforcement uh, support, Hamp, Lionel Hampton and Red Norbo would play with really hard mallets, you know, and so Hamp, both of them were, were, were drummers, uh, Terry Gibbs too, others, there are many, but uh, Cal, Cal Jada was a drummer, but, but um, Hamp, Hamp always brought that kind of drum approach, which is, which is a good thing too, but as you know, uh, playing the drums is not being just hitting it hard. It's about developing the sound, the making the resonance, and how do you extract a sound? How do you make this, I don't have my stick. How do you make this a part of your arm? That's the key. This thing is different. This is something that's not in your, it exists separate from your, your body, and you have to hold this and then make this thing hit this thing and make it an extension. Whereas if you play a clarinet, if you play a soprano saxophone, you play a tenor saxophone, you play a trumpet, you play uh, whatever wind instrument, you automatically are, you know, this one intermediary, which is the stick, is not there because you're blowing into the, the, the reed or the mouthpiece. So you have to think in terms of, and, and for those instruments, you have to think in terms of breathing, obviously. Right, so, right. So for percussionists to understand the power of the breath and how much control comes from breath as opposed to just flailing with the hands, yeah, that's, that's the art form. But it comes down to, though, that if, you're, if you, we were just talking about we did outdoor gigs last week, and you know, if, you, if you're playing too subtle, I didn't play that tune that I just played in the outdoor gig because I don't play ballads. I've learned not to play ballads outdoors because it's too subtle. So I'm, right. yeah, it's floating and <laughs> cosmic and everything. So it's like, I'm trying to, da -da 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 -da, I'm trying to hit it and have the shoulders. Then, as you said, also the thing about the strength coming from the shoulders as opposed to just the wrist or the, the arms or the, um, the forearm or the elbow. So all these things are the different layers that we have to think about in trying to extract a sound as percussionists. Yeah, well, we, we could probably talk all night and this has been a lot of fun and uh, I guess we do need to cut it short to keep it within our little bit time restraints that we're trying to keep these clinics at. But I do wanna say thank you so much, Jay Hogard, for coming and doing this. And I, I know you're on the, uh, the committee with me, uh, the pedagogy committee. Uh, and again, thank you for doing this presentation and your, your information on the instrument has been very valuable. It'll be on uh, YouTube and uh, please, everybody, you know, check it out. Tell your friends. This is a great resource for us as vibraphone players to be able to get into each other's mind and you know, get the information. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jerry. It's a pleasure. And I'm glad that we've been friends for so long, we were friends before we met in 1987, and hopefully we can be friends for another 50 years while we're still here banging on those things, you know? <laughs> All right, buddy, thank you so much. All right, best to you. You too, man. You can, stop, you, the you can stop the recording, I guess. Oh yeah, no, yeah, you're good. Stop recording.